produces ideas, and then you have to articulate those. I mean, a lot of times I would see a thing, just take it in, and then that was the foundation for it. That he, it was the, the fertile ground for ideas, and the idea would sprout from just observing, observing, observing. Um, so look around anywhere, really look. And because we tend to go through life kind of asleep, you know. So, and people, we, we know this more and more, and people talk about this a lot these days. Uh, but it's one thing to talk about, and another to really work um, actively uh, with that insight. Um, look around anywhere, and you see new characters, possible stories. You, and like, for example, if you, if you say, well, how do I deal with characters in the story? I mean, you can, there's two ways you can go. You can, you can use the uh, convenient tropes that, that, we, that people use, like little, you know, cookie cutters, and then build on those so that they have some uh, surface textures, you know, some, like you, you take a, uh, like, you know, like, like the, for example, the, uh, the, the uh, first woman uh, starship captain uh, in, at least in Star Trek, um, Janeway, is that her name? Um, so, you know, she's a good character, but she's basically kind of a cookie-cutter cook character. So she was a, uh, a strong woman, which is in itself can be cookie-cutter, or a strong man can be cookie-cutter, you know, can be just sort of formulaic in itself. Um, she was, a, a, you know, observant. She wasn't taking crap from people. She didn't suffer fools, but she was not unkind. And so you added more and more and more on this basic outline of this uh, strong female figure in command um, so that she becomes textured. And that's good uh, if you can do that. And if at, that's like a default way to write, you know, you, you, you come, you vampire character. He's a, he's a lonely vampire, but he has a heart of gold. <laughs> you know, and he really doesn't want to be taking everybody's blood, but... And he must, he's doomed to a li an existence of loneliness. I uh, can't really connect with people because he has to eat them in some <laughs> sense. Uh, and so you get that's a pretty standard. Um, and um, that's kind of a spectrum in, in vampire writing, for example, between that and, and, got, and then the guy who's like really enjoys being a total predator. And all he wants is to find another predator to enjoy despoiling humanity. With him, that's that's another trope, you know. There's a spectrum between those two of that particular sub subgenre. I'm just using this as an example, and you can take either one, and then you can add layers of uh, detail about them. The you know the the one um, who's the lonely one likes loves the ballet, and he keeps going to the ballet after all they have them at night. He manages to feed before, so he's re reasonably sated, and maybe I'm just making this up. But he falls in love with a ballet dancer, and that that has a certain kind of wistful poignancy about it in the first place. Uh, and so you have this cliche that then takes on a little more life, uh, and and it also happens that um, this certain works of Stravinsky make him you know, burst into tears or, or, or uh, you know, like lose control of himself and he has to rush away in the night. Um, or if you think of, of uh, the Phantom of the Opera comes to mind, we didn't really know a whole lot about that guy uh, from the, at least the movies, let's say. Uh, he was a, a, a composer of operas who uh, had a terrible accident, destroyed his face, and so he retreated into the darkness and he had a big resentment against the situation that, that left him that way and, and he became more and more obsessed with his atheism and came from his, you know, where his genius was, was uh, unacknowledged and so on. So, but that's really, we just, the basic guy, the angry person who's been damaged and must retreat into darkness, but he's an artistic genius. That's very, you see variations of that, and you can, and, 
as we go, we show more and more of the humanity of this guy as his story un un unreels and he comes involved with a woman who perhaps kidnaps her. Um, I can't remember, but they, they come together and, he, and so then the tender side of him emerges. So then you, once more, you know, uh, you, and he shows her his artistic side uh, in, in more than just sort of an angry, withdrawn way. And she sees, she sees all of these hidden sides of him. So you have this outline and, you've, and suddenly you've made it come to life too. So that's one way to develop characters. I've given you several examples. Um, I can find, I can go on and on with those. And, they're, and that's not invalid, because those are successful story, stories. And you can do good variations of cliches. You can take a cliche and a rather trite character and then bring some, something original to it, you know, and try and do it maybe a little more than, you know, like when you're playing a video game and they give you a chance to, to create a character that you are and you can make their hair blonde, but they, you're gonna, have a big mustache and you can take it and put it away and you know what I'm saying? It should be more than just that, you know, just putting and taking away things. But it should feel organically part of the same character and things sort of fits. But it still comes starts with that basic outline and you and so if you know if you're lost for a character you can work on that. And then later on as you develop as a writer you know, perhaps you can go into more kind of original character building based on your observations. Uh, one key to increasing one's observation is being aware of the degree of one's awareness in the first place. When I'm out interacting with the world, how much am I lost in some gray study in a daydream? Or, at nowadays, people are lost in their smartphones. Uh, to what extent am I really inhabiting myself, really seeing, feeling, smelling, hearing what's there around me in the world? If I turn my attention toward my own level of awareness, I'll discover that typically I'm not very aware as I move around the world. And as a writer, that see, you're losing all these possibilities. There's all this stuff that's the subject for, for uh, writing all around you and you're not seeing it. Um, and so what you lose, uh, if you give in to that, um, is verisimilitude, which is believability, you know, which is like the tang, the taste, the believable. Uh, verisimilitude, believability, that's a key to persuading a reader that what you're describing is real. And you want that, you want that, um, that, a capacity to suspend their disbelief. That's famously for science fiction, fantasy, you get the reader, if it's a reader or the viewer of the movie or the game, whatever it is, the comic book. Uh, easier to do in writing though, in writing, I'm sorry, in writing a, a novel, say, or a short story than it is in, in uh, some other genres. To get people to suspend their disbelief so they no, you know, people can't have wings and fly and they can't, uh, you know, they can't transfer into the body of, a, of an alien primitive on an avatar and so on. So you have to get people to suspend their disbelief of that by, by creating details that make it have the tang of reality and also are consistent with them. Um, and so how do you get that? By observing life. Well, what is the, what is the, texture of life, what's the tang, what's the flavor, the distinct flavor of life, what's the distinct flavor of life in a bus station, what's the distinct flavor of life in a steel mill, or in a forest, uh, in a men's bathroom, in the, uh, in a, at, uh, uh, at a pool where there are lots of children swimming in, a, in, a, in a, you know, things that you can see if you have the opportunity to ever uh, tour or or if you happen to be on the on the inside without having to tour a prison, um, you can that's that's all fodder. That's for uh, the its quality of reality, like that makes it a little distinct. I mean, if I'm writing, I I have a um, a novel called Bleak History. Uh, it's about people with um, 
with, with a kind of a parapsychological abilities who find one another uh, in, against the backdrop of a city. But, um, and uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff in it that's you know, hard to believe innately. But I, I ground it, I ground everything so much in this world that I, their parapsychological ability seems a little bit realer for that because it happens against the backdrop of something you've experienced somewhere or seen. Um, and you see that in the movies. You'll see, you'll see people, uh, you, you know, you know, using super abilities against a, it used to be that there would be in a kind of a slick, vague backdrop and like, you know, it wasn't that gritty, but now they've, they've, sh they've started putting paranormal activities against gritty backdrops because it helps people suspend their disbelief. And these backdrops are made out of the real world that we live in and we have to observe them to really evoke. Everyone is a character in a novel. Because everyone has some kind of drama in their life that comes and goes. Sometimes the drama is internal, you know, just the drama, the, in, the internal drama of their of a loneliness or or, in, or desires, uh, unrequited desires, or or uh, their be a capacity to bask in something that makes them happy, and they they can't really share it very well. But it's still it's 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 this powerful thing actually. And if you read it in a novel, you would really get it. But this is, but we look at this person, it's just somebody vaguely talking and interacting with us, and we don't realize everybody is a character in their own novel. So if you can f observe people and your own life that way, and, uh, without being melodramatic about it, just looking for what is there, the, you can find a way to connect that uh, into your writing. It's there if you're really looking close. Um, drama is always all around us, but usually we don't see it because we're not paying attention, but also we're defending ourselves against things. Oh my gosh, I just read this, I saw this headline, and I thought, no, I don't want to read this article. Uh, Seven-year-old boy uh, tortured for years by his parents and then allowed to starve to death. And uh, now the, the, the relatives who kept trying to warn uh, Child Protection Services about it are suing Child Protective Services for because they dropped the ball over and over again, and even though there's overwhelming evidence that the horrible, horrible things are happening to these parents, these children with their the kid and his step parent. And I didn't, but I did read it uh, because I just kept. Well, I kept thinking about it, yeah, I just like, you know, I wanted to find out some, something mitigating in there. It can't have been that bad. Yes, it was. <laughs> uh, but see, you know, that's like, that is happening somewhere behind you know, closed doors. You know, we're walking down the street. Most people are live more relatively normal lives, but that, those kinds of things are happening also. And we don't want to look at it because it's painful if we get a glimpse, you know, because it's, it, we, you know, it's, it's I per, I'm very empathetic, it really, I find it painful, you know. Uh, obviously, we see a homeless person, it's easy to dismiss them. Sometimes it is their fault. Sometimes it isn't. Sometimes they're just mentally ill, some, you know. Um, it's all of those. It can be any of those. Probably two-thirds of them, though, were people who needed help and didn't get it. And, whether it was uh, psychological or with addictions or something. And you know, that every one of them is a drama. Uh, and, and I mean, it's, when you go, to, when you go down the street, who, whoever you're encountering, and someone like that, a homeless person, but also just people on the street passing through, um, if you were to see like this random person who's walking by, nothing extraordinary about them, if you were to, to uh, follow them, see a line following them back through their day and like accelerated in an accelerated way through their previous day and their previous day and their previous day, all it's this sort of tunnel of their of shape of them of that person it, that you'd envision going back and back and back and back to through various birthdays and 
personal tragedies and triumphs and whatever, uh, a house fire or whatever happened, uh, you would see them all the way back into emerging from the womb. And it's one, all one series of continuity from when you walk by them in the street all the way back through all that. There's a line, even if even the parts where they're there were sleeping that night. And it just reminding oneself of that just kind of awakens us to the inherent drama of life that we can observe around us that can, that can, can bring life to the most banal genre. Uh, let's see, there were some exercises. Uh, go to a place that's tediously familiar to you, like the supermarket or the post office, where you have to stand in line. Deliberately use the time where you would normally just space out or look at your phone or something, um, or even where you would normally do something useful like reading a book. Don't, don't do it, just as an exercise once in a while. Use the time to practice observing. Turn your attention to people and things around you as if you've never seen anything like them before. Pretend you're from Mars, if you like. So this is what creatures look like on this planet. This is how they behave. You've probably all gotten in that, tried that at some time, because we're all, people here, we're probably all, uh, you know, we're people who've gotten, who've been exposed to a lot of fantastic fiction and aliens, uh, characters and so on. The main thing is to see them freshly, with telling details uh, will likely jump out at you if you look freshly at, at the place as well as the people. The writer, any environment is a potential setting. I mean, what happened if you were standing in line there and, and uh, some this is America in the 21st century, not hard to envision, a lunatic comes in and starts randomly shooting people or in some sort of lunatic ideologue. Well, and what happened, you don't have to see that something that extreme, but if you just, you know, want to kind of set your mind in motion about all the possibilities, or somebody bursts in and confronts somebody else, you know. Uh, I just found I just found these images of you with this woman and and she's like weeping. He says, not here, not in that, you know, and you know, you know what I'm saying? Those that that is a way to, to awaken sort of your attention. And then um, you can like look at the details of their clothing or whatever in, in a sort of a Sherlock Holmesian way and try and figure out what their life is like. Where they, where they might have been, why did they choose those particular things, and so on. Um, so, anyway, you get the gist of all that. I've gone on too long about it, but, but uh, it's like just talking about the structure of storytelling and, and, and outlining and so on, uh, which the people before us were doing, that is important. And we can do that, and but that is like so easily found. Um, you can look that up on the internet, uh, really easily. Um, how, like how to make a story outline. I mean, the simplest way is just is just to go into a first person's state of writing, um, for, or, for, or present tense, either one, first person, or just present tense. But I um, mean, usually what seems to work best for our minds when we're working up an outline is present tense because it gives a kind of weird objectivity. Um, you know, Joe it, it is walking down the street and uh, uh, thinking about how he's going to raise money to pay for school when a, uh, a dazzling light uh, catches his attention and he looks up and see if, sees a face looking back at it from inside a little. Uh, a, a box that seems to be cut, a uh, square that seems to be cut in space, and the hand reaches down. See, you know what I'm saying? That's like, you don't have to be all that, that um, startling, startling or striking, but just, 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 uh, just that approach. That's, and then you just, with outlining, that if you're thinking about outlining a story for whatever it is you plan to write. Just get into that frame of mind and do it that um, 
pithily, that uh, succinctly, that that brevity, so that you have a, a big event like that described in a paragraph or two. And if you, I'm probably just for your own reference, just write, you know, part one, part two, chapter one, chapter two, uh, day one, day two. I have a famous writer friend, Tim Powers, uh, I don't know if you've read him, he's a great novelist. And he does thing. he does his initial outline. I don't use outlines myself unless I'm paid to, but he, he does his initial outline on a calendar. He gets one of the, a large calendar that has a little lot of space. And, you know, and he picks a date, but okay, this is gonna, these events are gonna unfold in October. And I'm gonna make a start on a Sunday. And then he writes some little letters on it. You know, uh, Frank uh, is persuaded against his better judgment to go see a medium who is, uh, and he thinks they're all uh, uh, fakes. Um, this one startles him by telling him something that only his mother could know. And, and, um, and, uh, and also something that he didn't know about a, a certain place name the this, this, and this. He goes there and, you know, so that's like chapter one, and he's got it on the day that it happened. And that way he doesn't get lost and he just keeps this, he has, the, he has buys these calendars. I mean, these are regular on the wall calendars, but with a fair amount of space, the ones that have the big, like a big page. Because he, you know, and that way he, because his stories tend to be sort of labyrinthine that way track in time. If he has something that happens on the on uh, the same day, then if there's not enough room for it there, he, he um, takes a little stick it note, you know, and, and puts it right next to it. And they, this is the big things, the big overarching things, and he's just trying to make sure that the story he has in mind is more or less logical. And then you start writing. He'll glance at that, but he'll also put in things, a whole new series of things, uh, and another um, another character, and so on. That, that's not on that. But that's that's to kind of help him pace through it. And I mention it just because it's such a simple, straightforward way. You, using these kind of super elaborate outlining techniques is not necessary. Just You can just write um, day one on a piece of paper and do it. Um, present tense so that you get, kind of get into that frame of mind. You write the book, there's sort of a trend toward writing in present tense. Uh, I don't know why they think it's either more immediate or more arty. I don't think it's more effective to, to past tense, but there's a, but people do it. But, I, but you'll find that most of the time when commercial books are a success, they're actually not in present tense. They're not like, he goes to the window and, and and uh, stares moodily out across the uh, uh, the pond outside the Hilton, um, and thinks about Beth. Uh, he instead, you know, it's third person. He went to the window and, and stared moodily out. And for some reason, that is generally more commercial to do. Um, people are are used to it, but mm, also to me, it's. It's sort of more in the traditional storytelling, in the in the uh, which you trace back to people sitting around a fire and telling stories. When you when you tell stories like that, you know you you don't usually go in the present tense. Uh, like if, you, if you're telling a story to get a at a at summer camp about a guy with the guy the hook-handed guy or something, you know, the, uh, and you usually probably say. Then she, then she went into the woods alone because she wanted to prove he didn't exist. Uh, but then she saw the hook flashing down and she ran. And, you know, that's how we usually tell stories, and I and I recommend it. And also, if you're just lost, just think of it that way. Just think of it like you're telling a story to uh, somebody else to entertain them. So how would I, you know, like I'm, how? How do I get people involved in my story? You know kind of what's going to happen. Well, in your mind, or as you write it, or whatever, 
you can just write it as you would as you would tell it to somebody else, more or less. And then when you go back over it, you can add detail and embellishments without losing pacing. And pacing is something beat the story. You have to always keep track of. It's got to be something that you that you develop innately if you're going to do a lot of writing, whether you're writing scripts, whether you're, uh, whether you're writing a video game material, the stories that go into those, whether you're writing books, short stories. Um, it's just, this is uh, something that has to, you have to develop an innate sense for it. Like, it's if you're just starting out learning drumming, almost literally. And so you have to kind of like, when you read, and here's a big part of, of my advice in all this, you have to read, see how much time I have, okay, okay. You have to read things, novels, short stories, um, and if you're gonna write scripts for television or something, read scripts, you can get them on the internet now. And actually sit down and read the whole damn thing compare them to what's on the screen, it won't always be the same. In each case, whatever it is what, that you want to write and you're, you're learning about, you, you have to read good uh, examples um, of, you know, in that genre or in that medium. And you have to uh, be actively observing as you read to try and pick up things like pace, how fast things happen in a story, like the big events in a story, how fast do they come? I mean, they don't always have to be fast. How slowly do they come? They can build up slowly, but as long as it's relatively steady, it can happen. And also, big events uh, can seem almost slower paced because more is happening. Um, so you can have this big thing that takes a long time to describe, but it mostly it happens over two minutes, you know, as this as the mole men first break up through the ground or whatever it is, and, and ex, you know, and expose themselves and buildings fall down. Um, nevertheless, they're still pacing. And if it's a series of small things, like in a mystery story that leads into a bigger thing, the, you know, the culmination of the mystery, well, that'll be, That'll be a, a, a different kind of pacing as its own sort of distinctive pacing. You'd better develop a feel for it or you're gonna lose people. You'll lose your reader if you don't have a sense of pacing. Um, and it's, that is something that is derived probably from our biology and our instincts and the wiring of our brains. It's that fundamental. Other kinds of writing don't really worry about it. They're more you have another basis. If you're going to read Proust, it's not exactly a concern. But in the majority of, of, of uh, writing that you're going to be uh, attempting, most people when they're starting out, even if it's fan fiction, which is cool, it still has pacing and it has characterization and and that yet if it's like typical genre fiction, you need characterization, you just not need to not go on too long about it. So what that means is you have to find a descriptor that gives you a sense of that person without going into a long detail about it. And that's part partly will arise from your observation of people. What you know, um, some irritating habit that person has that tells you a little about their innate character, perhaps, you know, that you, a guy that was, that was so uh, uh, condescending at the party that you went to last night, you know that guy, <laughs> or girl, lady, uh, or child that, that, that was like, God. Um, you know, they have some characteristic that it, that it seems like just a little superficial thing, but really it tells you a lot about their inner attitude toward the world. 
you have to try and observe those things so that you can get into the character quickly and still have a sense of reality underlying it without losing that. Some, some little, so I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, you know, classical examples people always go back to is uh, Sherlock Holmes, the character. Um, I mean, obviously, it doesn't really take long to discover that he's an extraordinary person. In the, in the book. Um, first of all, you know, there's his, he'll, he'll, he's just, you, you may encounter him for the first time and he says, I see that you've been in India recently. What the hell, how do you know that? <laughs> and, uh, and he explains it's because of certain specific little, little uh, clues uh, having to do with the, the, the edge of, of your boot and it's not all that believable actually if you really think about it but but he he makes it Doyle Conan Doyle made it believable in the in the writing and so just the fact that this guy would do that is is says about something about him like his and the way that he he he, he looks at people he just he sees them differently than, than other people do and it tells us a lot of it and that's something that can happen in like you know you can describe him doing that in a few seconds and plus, he may have an, he has a sort of disdainful objectivity about it, uh, and uh, his very dry way of talking about people and things. Oh yes, it is. You know, they, they so typically are, are uh, you know, uh, the, those who spend most of their time in the army are, uh, are uh, have the affliction of being. Um, all too rigorously bound to the clock, even long after they've, they've left the army behind. And, you know, and, and uh, he makes some sort of dry little joke about it. And so just to, you know, that's entertaining. And, uh, and, and simultaneously as being entertaining, it tells us something about his character. And he's a kind of extreme example, you know, to have characters like that. That's just an example of finding ways to make your character stand out, but with brevity, so that you don't lose readers. Um, but let, let me just throw it out now, that's just some general observations about beginning writing. Let me say that I approve of fan, fan fiction, because even if the people never write any professional fiction, never get paid for it, they're still expressing themselves, um, you know, uh, in a literate way, more or less. Um, you know, they're using they're using words in sentences, and they're and they're and it's an expression of their the the reading that, that they've done. So it's important um, because people are, are read very little nowadays relative to previous times and. We, I do think we lose something if we lose our contact with books. And so anything bookish uh, is good. Uh, and also a lot of people start can start with fan fiction and become professionals. And I don't see why not. Um, the Lovecraftian circle people were all doing that. The one you know H.P. Lovecraft is. You probably do. Uh, people like Robert Bloch, who went on to become a really well-known famous writer, uh, most famously wrote Psycho, and the basis of it. Um, he, was, he started out being a fan fiction writer, writing Lovecraftian fiction, essentially, pretty much. Um, all kinds of, of writers in that, uh, you know, started out just writing for fun about their favorite things, and then somehow they were able to make the jump. And you, so it's like if you if you do something if you do writing for pleasure, then, you know then that pleasure can transmit to the reader, and uh, that if you can if you can find a way to do that um, for the marketplace, then your writing for pleasure can actually uh, make you a professional eventually. But it's it's all based on what you've read. If you if. A lot of people will try to write science fiction without having read much science fiction. They think that having watched a certain amount of anime is, was enough. <laughs> but really, you do need to read quite a bit of it uh, if you're going to write books. And it, I think the better science fiction that is in 
television uh, it is all written by people who read a lot of books as well as watch television. There's very few people who are actual professionals who are not reasonably literate. Um, so you read, 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 read is part of the beginning of being a writer. Um, just one has to always be reading something and read and, and read outside the genres you like as well as inside it. Because if you don't, then you're going to be at kind of a you, you tend to produce trite material. The outside genres help feed the uh, the more original material. Uh, that you find in genre writing. So, you know, having read a, a nonfiction work about uh, exploring the North Pole for the first time can uh, uh, really enliven your genre story about finding monsters under the ice in Antarctica. Um, but, you know, okay. anyway, I was going to open to questions, and there are still time for them, so please ask some. Even about, you know, like the most crude beginning sort of things. You like, don't even know how to even start. I mean, if you have a project, you're saying, well, I'm, does anybody have a project they want to ask about? Like, how would I, how do I take the next step in my project? Yes? Well, I mean, uh, that is a... Give me a general sense of it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I have a couple of different things. I have some novellas, I have short stories, and I actually have a children's book that I finished that... Uh, I've done some initial illustrations on, but I don't even, I don't, I bought every writer's market there is out there to look for a place to go, but I'm not sure the first step. <coughs> writer's I'm market going. things used to be useful, and now be, maybe because of the internet, I don't know what, nobody does very much work in them before them anymore. It used to be, used to be you could get a writer's market book and it would be definitive, but now you really have to cast about. You're talking about how do I find markets for these things I've written? Yeah, I, I, how do I find markets or people who would even be interested Are they in reading they a particular who, genre? Um, or various genres? Probably more suspense genre? and, and more for the suspense novel writing, but the children's book is nothing like that. And you're an illustrator? Yeah, I, I used to do comic strips in the newspaper for a couple of years. All right, well that sounds like you're pretty professional at that, and that's good that you can illustrate it. That makes it more saleable. Uh, what sort of story is the, it's the children's book? That sounds like the most immediately saleable thing you might have. What, yeah. If, what it's, is it? I actually wrote a story about uh, beans, many different colored beans called Newton beans, and that uh, it actually is in Seussian rhyme. And, uh, is what? Seussian rhyme? Yeah. It's very Seussian. In a way. Okay. Why not? Yeah. And uh, I did it based upon some illustrations my son did when he was a kid, mm -hmm. and they struck my fancy, so I wrote a story about them. Uh -huh. Kind of across cool. between Dr. Seuss and the Lord of the Rings. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so is it like aimed at a particular? Because that's what they always ask. What what age uh, range? I think this is probably the age range between uh, early readers and those who are just before they want to move on to something a little more meaty. Right. That's 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 reasonable. Uh, that's a, that's an area. I forget which one they call it, uh, like whether it's, I mean, because people develop differently, but they may say six to nine or yeah. something. Um, but that could include ten-year-olds and it could include five-year-olds. Um, am I t out of time? Uh, I don't think so. I was just coming to see how it was going. Oh, I, I, okay. Are the mics not I, I mean, I, I, huh? Are the mics not working? No, I just decided that it, it works it's better if I'm down here with people. I'm Especially when here. this kind of thing. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, the children's story, uh, did you finish it? Yeah, I haven't finished the illustrations. I just have the rough beginning of the illustrations, but the book, the book is finished. The story is finished. Well, how rough are they? I mean, can you, is it enough that they in color? Yeah, they're in color and they're uh, character descriptors of each of the characters in a couple of scenes. A couple uh, of scenes. From it, yeah. Well, you could submit it that way, uh, and they can see. Or you could, you probably come from a stronger basis if you actually get it done and really draw them all. But you got to be, but it is kind of a commitment. I mean, 
you can do something, and this is a very important skill and word to know if you're going to be a writer, and you probably have heard it, but what is a query, right? A query, professionally speaking, is, an, is a note, letter, or a letter, or, yeah, it's going to be in those, one of those forms, too. Uh, could be in the form of an email, but it should be written like a letter, uh, like some kind of scatterbrained email. It should be written, you know, formally, more or less. Uh, and, you, and you send it to uh, usually an editor, sometimes an agent. Um, and, um, you know, you, you get their name uh, off the internet, perhaps, but you can also get it by um, researching people. And, at events maybe like this one, more like it's, let's say you're gonna write mystery, it really helps to go to a mystery convention and ask around and, and say, well, and if you meet an editor, you, you make it a point to meet them and ask, can I send a query? Well, see, that's not, that, queries are easy for them to look at. It's only like a couple of paragraphs. So they usually say yes, you can send a query. And, and uh, that's just a, a note to them and they'll give an email where, or you'll find one somewhere. It may be listed in one of the rather feeble approximations of writer's markets that exist now. They're good doorstops. <laughs> they, you, they're usually outdated and they're usually, it, they, they used to not be outdated. But that's because, you know, the world has changed. So I'm, I, I'm just, uh, Grumbling because if they were so useful at one time, you know, you used to be able to find a magazine listed in a book, and in all probability, the magazine still existed by the time you sent a query to them or a or a cold submission to them. Uh, so, you know, I would say um, with your query. Uh, if you're going to try and get them interested in advance of having the thing completely finished, write um, like a one paragraph thing, summing it up, saying you're writing for this. And, you, and of course you've done your research about what kind of company, what kind of re research, what kind of publisher will publish this sort of thing. You have to have a look at there at the various publishers if you're talking about books, you know. Um, or in the magazines, if you want to write short stories, you have to read that magazine and get a sense of real, you know, what they do. Don't just just say, I'm sure that the, that I, Asimov Science Fiction Magazine will like this because it's science fiction. You should read, they'll all provide some sort of sense somewhere, usually on their internet, uh, on their website, uh, saying we're looking for this, this, and this. And you can also look at their catalogs, which are usually on the internet, of when it's book publishers. And you see, okay, they're doing these kinds of books. So, and I've read this one and this one. You do all of that. Do that, read that foundational research on the market. Uh, find the market, do the research to see really what do they want and try and, if you, in a, from a break-in point of view, you really need to provide some a sense that you are doing the kind of thing they have in mind. And of course you can try and work on the timing. I, you find out that the, the latest thing is, is uh, pet, it's people having pet ghosts, uh, uh, or, you know, let's say. And so, you, you know, bef before there are 8,000 pet ghost books, you, you find this out and, and you, you s submit a query for a good pet ghost book. Actually, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> you should probably do you a pet try. ghost. Somebody should do a pet ghost book. Um, and, uh, yeah. I have, uh, so you should do the query, yeah. one page, and then, ha and then have attachments of, of the images, the better images, a few of them. And just say, I'm writing and illustrating, because that kind of solves the problem for them out front. Mm -hmm. And if you have any professional, uh, any, prof any applicable professional uh, history, that you can you can list, and you seem to have some in newspapers and so on. Go ahead and list it without being too exhaustive and like all the high points and stuff. So it's a little it's a little like a resume, but it's more like um, just immediately pitching an idea briefly and uh, being really polite about it and not and um, 
uh, and and not not kind of like don't don't come at it with you're gonna love this this is gonna knock them dead you just you come at it somewhat humbly without being like a, you know you don't you without being too humble you want to have some confidence but so you see you strike a balance as you Measure as you write this query letter and uh, and um, you want to get right off the bat quickly telling them what what it is you're trying to sell. And I think that's what you would do with that book. The other things, I don't know, it would depend. I mean, if, have you submitted any of the other things anywhere? Um, not really, I haven't. I've been doing a lot of other work and haven't had a chance to, to submit those. Is the whole question of self-publishing is a big thing that probably needs its own, uh, its own class by somebody that is more experienced. I've never self-published. Um, and, but I, and I would say that it mostly is something that the majority of the time that people do to kind of get their confidence up. And they might, they might manage to reach a few readers. Of course, then you're up to all the exceptions. The guy who wrote The Martian, he just happened to have some scientists catch, you know, who, ah, oh, it's a long story, you can read it. But it's, it was mostly by chance that that became a bestseller out of self-publishing. Um, most most self-published books just sort of rise and and pop like bubbles on a, in a bubble bath, <laughs> you know they're they're that transient and uh, ephemeral. And, but um, it you know it's it could be something to try, and it's easy to do. See, you just look up how to do it online. Amazon will do it. So, but, and th so that could be a starting point, like fan fiction is a starting point uh, for some people. With the, with the new markets and with uh, the internet and things of that sort, I was considering for this children's book, actually, and I was inspired by Shel Silverstein, who used to narrate so many of his books, to do a I've version that. that's narrated along the side it so that the kids could even have something they could play while listening and the younger kids could listen and read well, you could do that. That would be that would be something that I wouldn't bother putting that in the query for the visual publication, the physical publication of a book. But you, they already already think about audiobooks anyway. But you could submit it uh, separately to audiobook publishers, and there are some that might do original audiobooks. I think I've had a lot of books that. Well, not a lot. I've had maybe five books that have become audio books, but that was just in the contract, and they just hired people to do it. But there are people who do, who pro I believe now, who create audio books originally as their book. I think that does happen, and it probably would be that model probably should happen more because because that was a good model for him. That was a long time ago, but I think it would be good for now because you can download these things so easily now. You know, and that would be a lot of, and you could put them on a kid's website or something, right? Yeah. And um, that's another thing to research, whether or not they're paying websites for kids that might be interested in your stuff. Um, so, any other questions about like projects that you have or something? that you're wondering how to get off the, how to start out? Did I not answer? Yes, ma'am. Um, we're both not writers, uh, but we're making a game. Okay. And we don't know if we should get a writer or if we should write it ourselves. What do you think is best? Well, I mean, if you can do it yourself, you should. Why, you know, it's just going to take more time and add more complexity and problems to, to bring in another person. On the other hand, bringing the, in the, another person might end up being necessary. But if you can do it without that, that's even better. I think probably uh, if you're a reasonably literate person, that is, I mean, you can put sentences together, and make a point, and you know, follow A, and make A follow uh, B, B follow A, and so on, and and kind of have a sense of drama about it going somewhere. You know, you can probably do it yourself. Uh, I, I'm not really familiar with that kind of writing that much. Ex I've seen it. I did write one novelization. No, it was it was a short, a long short story for Dungeons and Dragons. But it was it was 
he published it online with a bunch of others. And they paid me a thousand bucks just to write this little story. And I'd never played Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> but I, in the course of doing this, they sent me four or five Dungeons and Dragons books that are kind of, and I um, looked over those and I picked up some of the feel of that kind of thing. Is it like that? Is it like D&D &D kind of narrative where you would have little cards and then put this little miniature story on that and, and the character that is, it, you know, is it a fantasy based thing? Probably. It's sci-fi, but it's, I wouldn't consider it D&D. &D. I think it's more like a story, general straight line right. type. But how does that develop as a game? Is it, is it, I mean, you're talking about the, like the backstory for a game? Like the, you know, the backstory no, like is you like. You follow the, the story through the game. Oh, well, so okay. You develop, I mean, I guess you could say it's like the, because you do decide what happens, but it's already been essentially. Well, set probably up. You sh you're going to write a whole story a ahead that eventually people will follow as they play out the game, and yeah. there will be one or two possible conclusions. Or exactly, three or yeah. Something. Well, you should write the whole story ahead then, and, but do it in a, in a brief way and just try and anything that bores you is going to bore anybody else who has to read this backstory. Like if you're submitting it to game publishers or something, if you're going to try and get, are you going to put out the thing yourself? Yeah, we're going to indie publish it. Right, well, then just write it for your own benefit. And, and then when you have stuff that it's going to be in the game, well, you have to just think about comp compactness, of course. So it's going to be on, on a card. But try and find some little spark you can put in any sentence that's going to be on a, on a card, you know. That's all I can recommend. Just make every little line sparkle with some interest. You know, uh, the, you know the, the, uh, the magic, the, the magic uh, skull is, is usually silent, but if you say its name, uh, the, the, the jewels appear in its eyes, and that's one line, and and then um, and then and then it, and it says the name of the demon, and maybe you get that much on a card or whatever you you're doing, you know, or in a little space or something, but see that has some has a little bit of imagery, has a little picture that make that's in people's heads, and then of course you illustrate that. Little. So you're probably going to start out kind of just uh, just uh, just finding images that are that are really cool, and then find compact ways to describe them, and uh, and just do it methodically. You probably have to do it several times to get it down to what you want it to be. So you have to remember drafting anything you do in any kind of writing for that for anything else. You got to draft, of course. That means. If you're, and let me give this quick piece of advice. If you, if anybody suffer from, want to write and suffer from writer's block, um, my advice is, is to write anyway without any kind of, uh, just remove, temporarily remove your critical factor for it and just let it spill out and, and just say, wow, this is real slop, well, don't worry about it. <laughs> and um, then, then, then the bloodletting starts once you get a chapter or, or four pages or whatever, you, you know, through uh, maybe a whole scene. I tend to do things by scenes because our generation is so cinematic. So when I write a novel, I do things in scenes. Uh, um, so that is, that is a pretty good way to organize a novel if you just think in scenes, like almost like a, a play or something. But you have to also, you know, have the kind of writing to the novel. Hey, where all the water go? <laughs> Over there. Um, uh, so uh, you, when you, you got to think about drafting. So, but let the thing come out first and, and don't be too judgmental. And then you go into a different head and this is another thing like pacing that has to become second nature. And suddenly you're, you're going to kind of like go into a transformation and you're gonna be your objective 
editor of yourself. And you kind of just cut mercilessly anything that's boring or anything that's, that's repetitive. Uh, especially repetitive stuff. You know, you have to trust your reader to absorb the information without saying it three different ways. Um, and uh, what, and also bring along your, your own reader self, like the person, like if you were reading this for fun, uh, for pleasure, what would you want to get rid of uh, if you were doing, why does the writer, you know, just try and be objective and bring your reader self into it, but definitely redraft. But don't worry about redrafting as you go if you're having a problem uh, staying in the writing state of mind. Uh, redraft, just be willing to redraft later and accept and accept it and, and just don't let anything stop you also if you really want to write. Don't let it, yeah, persistence is an absolute necessity. Um, there are some people who who's became published, publishable for uh, purchasable, marketable writers right from the get-go, but most people had to try over and over again. Ray Bradbury famously had to get rejected hundreds and hundreds of times. Robert Heinlein, I think, sold the third, first or second thing he wrote. But you have to be, you have to be, uh, have persistence. Heinlein eventually had to learn persistence when he, you know, would run into some kind of a, an issue. Um, so, is, are there any other questions? I was hoping that this was jewelry. <laughs> See if you just glance at it. You can't see it very well. Could be shiny. Could be jewelry. <laughs> What's the best way to differentiate different characters? Sell this for $10. Look, jewelry. I found jewelry. Like $10 Finders keepers. right now. Finders keepers. <laughs> Go over to you for five minutes. What's the best way to differentiate what? Uh, characters. As you're trying to uh, build characters, and uh, sometimes when you're writing, you find that a lot of them have a very similar voice. Uh, what do you do to try to differentiate the characters in the story? Well, you got to listen to people. That's what I was talking earlier about obser observation in the real world. People talk differently in different styles. Um, listen, try and notice it as you go through the world. Um, also, you know, when you watch a, a good movie, where you read a good book, uh, notice, notice that, wow, you know how, with what brevity they make a voice come alive in a person's voice, their way of speaking, their, their you know, uh, their their natural way of talking that fits for that character, and you you notice it, and you can you can kind of pick up on that. If you don't actively look for it, you might not be able to figure it out. But any reasonably intelligent person who actively looks at that will find the basic methodology for. For it, um, you just build it bit by up, bit by bit, if you have to. But it's it's a lot of it's from observation. Uh, but also, you, bit, you develop an ear for it, and you just go when you redraft. You just you just make a, a mark, you know, too much like Joe, and, and sometimes cutting, simply cutting unnecessary phrases will get rid of a lot of that. And then get it down to the bare, cut it down to the bare bones. Then you say, well, what is distinctive in this guy, you know, with this guy in the dialogue? Uh, now you can see it because you cut it down to the bare bones. And um, it's just easier to think about then after cutting. Any other questions? Uh, starter projects or anything? What's what's com coming next? Somebody's uh, next thing. Okay, well, my time's up anyway, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Okay, what, what are you talking about here? Uh, silly songs and earworms. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> but the many categories, also we're going to screen a little film, and a, uh, an homage to silent film. Well, that's, that's, a, a, that's a kind of a contradiction there, isn't it? I mean, one's silent and the other's uh, earworms, and yeah, well, I'm confused. Both in both worlds, right? All right, that's true. No, that sounds good. That's great. Thank you, John. Thank. All right, I'm here, so you guys can approach me in, about this, these questions as they have occurred to you. If you, I'll see if I can help. You said, "Find ways to make characters stand out with 
Yeah, start with brevity by cutting back their dialogue to the to the just what is absolutely necessary, so that you get rid of all the confusing foliage, on, and then you you just uh, build from there and say, okay, what what just like this guy being uh, he's from this background, he would he would use certain words that would have more meaning. You know, uh, so you can just even a change of one word can add characterization. He's more likely to, to you know, to. Uh, I mean, if he is, has has prejudices, uh, he might use a prejudicial word. Um, if if he has, uh, uh, if he if somebody is always trying to sell something, you know, he's gonna use buzzwords around selling. So that's a little character thing that he tends to fall back on. And it might be just the change of one word will go from just being like doesn't say anything about him to um, yeah that's a, he's using a buzzword all of a sudden having to do with selling. Um, so I'd have to see the material really probably uh, to really think about it that much more without taking up their time. But, but yeah, I think you start from there, cut back, and then look for even individual words that will. Um, resonate more with what we know of, of his, in his background. Thank you very much.